sit and check. Am I on? Is this on? Check, check. There it is. Okay. All right. <clears throat> I don't want juice. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, good evening, good evening. We are going to get started. Wow, you guys got quiet really fast. That was, if I could get my students to get quiet that fast, I would be a gold standard teacher. Wow. Well, welcome tonight. If you're watching from home, welcome to the auditorium. You truly are na no, we are truly pilgrims and strangers in the school. Right, so they have some stuff going on out there, so just be mindful when you leave, because um, they got the big wigs everywhere. Um, the sheets are on the back table, if you didn't grab one for Zechariah, but I got a few announcements before we jump into our Bible study tonight. Uh, a lot of stuff coming up, happening, a lot of moving parts over the next few weeks. What else is new? Uh, there's this men's meeting tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. You can reach out to Mr. Mike Murphy for details about that. I think he wants to make it an open meeting, uh, meaning uh, there's a verse or a testimony or something about the Lord you want to bring to the table to bless your brethren. Now's the time to do it. Uh, we might read a portion together, sing a song, uh, share a blessing from the Word of God. We kind of like, just like kind of wash each other's feet that way. Then next Friday, which is I think the 22nd, some of us are heading up north for a youth camp or fall camp or whatever we call it now. It used to be October camp, and now it's just camp. It's, uh, it's Christmas in July, October in September. Uh, but uh, just pray for us. we got about 17 of us, including uh, chaperones, uh, three vehicles heading up, and uh, we'll be there until um, come home Monday morning, um, which will be Monday afternoon when we get here, but Monday morning. So just pray that the Lord would meet with us. I'm looking forward to just, you know, meeting with the Lord and uh, seeing some brethren that I don't always get to see, and we get to rub shoulders with, you know, our good friends from Staten Island and some good friends from Rochester. Uh, so just, uh, just appreciate your prayers for that. Um, pray that it's not cold at night, too. <laughs> Madeline is like, yes, yes, amen, amen. I see that hand, amen, All right? So I was just telling Brian, there was, their, la their first year was last year. And, uh, yeah, it's going to be great. It's going to be great. First, she has to get stitches before we leave, which was a whole other fiasco. Uh, and then the first night was like the Arctic wind, the north wind. You know, it was supposed to be the, the, the Song of Solomon. It's like, come south wind. But this was the north wind blew through that place. And what did it get down to? Was it like in the 30s? That, it was in the, she knows. She was like, it's 35. I got it. <laughs> it was like 30, deg 30 something degrees. And I saw Mario the next morning. And he gave me that look with that smile like, yeah, it was a little cold, you know, it's like, yes, you guys aren't leaving yet, are you? So, they it was bad, it got warmer the next two days, yeah, 50s, right, 50s at night are doable, but, that, but, so just pray it's in the 50s, right, many of us who have been up there is just smirking and smiling, because we're at the mercy of the Lord, uh, but it's always good, you know, it's always good. Um, then, also at the same time, if you're not going to camp, there's plenty of stuff here to keep you busy, all right, so, lest I... There is a fair on Saturday, the 23rd, Aberdeen Day, right over here at Matawan Regional High School. That's a nice fair um, right in the township where we meet. So we get to really rub shoulders with a lot of people, and people recognize, like, oh, you're the guys that hold the signs. Yeah, we're the ones that hold the signs. Uh, and then on Sunday, the 24th, we have Marlboro Day, which will be happening uh, right after service. It starts at 12. So if you want to come to church and then shoot out to Marlboro, which is about 15 minutes from here, that's a very nice fair. It ends at 4 o'clock. It's a beautiful fair on the grounds of a, the Marlboro Township Municipal Building over there. So uh, two opportunities for you to plug in. It's great. There's only a few left. There's that one, these two, and then uh, Matawan Day in the beginning of October. So um, keep that in mind. Um, also, we haven't nailed the definite date down, but I'm thinking in the next probably week or probably two weeks we're going to start our Master Clubs. I'm just trying to nail down the space in here where we could use, uh, but we will keep people posted about that. I know there's about a dozen people interested and some helpers are coming out of the woodwork, which would make for a nice rotation. Um, and then that first Saturday of October in the cafeteria, we are starting our Discipleship 2 class for those of you that are signed up for that. So we'll send out more information about that. Um, Lord willing, we will finish the Old Testament next week. 
Glory! Right? I'm just doing that for myself. Uh, we're going to get through Zechariah today. And when we're done with Zechariah, can you please tell me what it's about? Because I'm still not 100% sure. But uh, after that, I wanted to leave it time for some Q&A. We've done many a night where we did some Q&A, question and answer. So I haven't done that in a long, long time. So if you've got some questions on your heart or mind through all the material you've looked at or your own reading, you can ask any question about the Word of God and I'll do my best to answer it or deflect it to someone I think can. Uh, some things to pray about. Uh, pray for uh, youth camp, again. Uh, pray for laborers. There's a lot of stuff happening and Jesus said, pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Uh, pray for our space situation. We continue to keep getting kind of bounced around, um, so I'm just praying that we could continue to find favor. Uh, and just pray for, I spoke with um, Mike Murphy a little while ago, and just continue to pray for Jimmy, right? Jimmy's back in the hospital, Jimmy Murphy. Uh, they're trying a different hospital this time, so because he, he's on that roller coaster still, so just pray for that, that the Lord would have mercy on that, all right? So join me if we, as we pray right now, and then we'll jump into our study. If you would pray silently, and I'm going to pray out loud. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, dear Lord, that we could be alive today. Thank you, Lord, that you're the God of, who controls the seas and the tempest, Lord. You say, peace, be still, Father. And I'm just thankful, Lord, that we're in your control. We're in your hands, Father, in whose hand is the soul of every living thing and the breath of all mankind, Father. And I just pray, Lord, you just... Hide us behind the cross tonight, Father. Help us to submit to your leading today, Father. Lord, we ask in Jesus' name for youth camp, Father, may it be a reviving. Starting with my own heart, dear Lord, I'm not ashamed to ask, Lord. I ask for reviving. I ask for our folks going, Lord. May there be a shout in the camp. May you come down and spend time with us there, Lord. If we would be with you, Father, you would warm our hearts, depending regardless of what the weather is like, Father. If you meet with us, it's all worth it. So please come down and visit this vine, dear Father. And Lord, we ask, Lord, for laborers, Father. Thank you for the laborers you've raised up. So grateful for that, Lord. Musicians and helpers and just folks doing all different stuff, Father, handing out tracts, going out on the street. Lord, continue to raise up laborers, Father, for the different ministries you've entrusted to us. Lord, I pray for our space situation, Lord. I don't know exactly what to pray for, Father. I thank you every day we can meet here, Father. I Pray you'd guide our steps. If there is a space out there, Lord, make it plain and clear. Help us to find continued favor with the folks in this district, that we continue to have a space where we can come and gather. And Lord, we just ask uh, for Jimmy Murphy, Lord. I just pray for, uh, just help take care of him, Lord, his body. Give him comfort in his mind, Lord, and his heart, Lord. I know he's probably troubled, and his wife, Terry, and the family. It's just a roller coaster, Father, but Lord, you control everything, Lord. So I pray you just... Just whisper, peace be still to that situation, Lord. May there, may there be some improvement health-wise, and just most importantly, Lord, there might be some just calm in their spirit that comes from your hand, knowing that, Lord, you'll never leave them nor forsake them. And guide us as we jump into this study in Zechariah, Lord. Give us understanding, because quite frankly, Lord, it's, it's, a, it's a cryptic book, Lord, with lots of visions and lots of symbols, and I pray, Lord, you just give us understanding, help us to take something away from this that'll make us better for you. In Jesus' name I ask you, Father. Amen. All right. So if you, hey, all right. If you would open up to Zechariah chapter 1, if you have your sheet there, Zechariah is a tough one. I ain't going to lie. It's like wrestling a marlin these last few days. <laughs> Uh, but um, tried to make some sense of it, too, and boil it down to something that we could grab something. 14 chapters, 211 verses, 6,443 words. Zechariah is the prophet of restoration and glory. He is the prophet to the remnant that they're going to be restored, that they're going to inherit future glory. And um, he was probably born in Babylonian captivity and probably returned to Jerusalem on that first migration with Zerubbabel, that 50,000 that came down. And he was probably a very young man when he returned. In Zechariah 1.1 it says that he's the son of Berik, uh, Berikiah, the son of Edo, the prophet, right? So he's the son of Berikiah, the son of Edo. Now, the speculation is that his father probably died in infancy 
and he's left to be raised by his grandfather. Here's why we think that, or people think that, and it looks pretty clear to me too. Notice in Zechariah 1.1, the son of Berechiah, the son of Edu, right? Edo. Now go to, hold your place there, just jump over to Ezra chapter 5. Ezra, those post-exile books, Ezra 5. Look at verse 1. Ezra 5, 1. Then the prophets, Haggai the prophet, and Zechariah the son of Edo. Notice it doesn't mention Berechiah there. Look at chapter 6, verse 14. And the elders of the Jews builded, and they prospered through the prophesy of Haggai, the prophet, and Zechariah, the son of Edo. So the speculation, I think it's a safe speculation, is that how do we reconcile that? Whose son is he? Well, he's the son of Berechiah, but possibly Berechiah, his father, dies, and he's raised by his grandfather, Edo. And if you notice, uh, I'm not going to turn there, but if you, if you flip over to uh, Nehemiah 6, you, you don't have to flip there, you find out that Edo was a priest. So it looks like Zechariah was a priest as well as a prophet. He was grown up under the tutelage of a priest, and he's a prophet. And the three names associated with him tell a great story. Listen to these names. His name is Zechariah. Zechariah means Jehovah remembers. Right? Jehovah remembers. And he's the son of Berechiah. That means Jehovah blesses. But he's raised by Edo, which means the appointed time. Put them all together, and if you have any preach in you, you have a message. Jehovah remembers, Jehovah blesses at the appointed time. Those are the three names that are surrounding this man. And for somebody who's preaching to a remnant that might have thought God forgot them, who had just come through captivity, the one that's encouraging them is the one whose name means Jehovah remembers, the son of Jehovah blesses, raised by the one whose name means the appointed time. So, Zechariah is a contemporary of Haggai. Let's go back to Zechariah. He's a contemporary of Haggai, probably the younger of the two. Because in Zechariah 2.4, the Lord addresses Zechariah as a young man. So Haggai might have been a little bit older and Zechariah a bit younger. And uh, Zechariah is not as hard as Haggai. Haggai was tough, very practical. But Zechariah is more encouraging. He's encouraging these disheartened people. I mean, they're, they're, they're... capital is in rubble, is in ruins. They've just come out of captivity. What have they lost? Some of their families still stayed in Babylon. So there are disheartened people. They've made this migration back to basically ruins, rubble. And what does he prophesy mostly of? Israel's future glory. And can I tell you something, folks? This is a little bit of preaching for us here. That is God's method of encouragement. God's method of encouragement is to get your eyes off of the sad now and look to the glorious later. He does that all the time. How many times Paul talks about, even to a young church like the Thessalonians, he talks to this baby church in Thessalonica, what, about the Lord's coming every chapter, every chapter. Why? Because they were in affliction, they were in heartache, they were in difficulty. What do you tell them? The coming, the coming, the coming, the coming. We beseech you by the coming, the coming of the Lord. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. He gives them all this information about the coming of the Lord. Why? Because that's how you get out of your funk. By getting your eyes off the sad now. Because if you stay on the sad now, you stay miserable. Get your eyes on the beautiful later, and you kind of can lift your spirits. Because weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. And he ministers for three, and I know how it's like. I know it's easy to get stuck in the now. 
because it looks like the night is not ending. It looks like you're kind of like in the mud and you just keep hitting the accelerator and just, you're spinning your wheels and it's like you just keep digging the trench deeper and deeper. But you know what you got to do? You got to surrender and you got to just get your eyes on what God has in store for you. And, he'll, and all of a sudden, he'll, he'll get you out in his appointed time. Jehovah remembers, Jehovah blesses at the appointed time. That's Zechariah. He ministers for three years. Remember, Haggai had a very short ministry, about three months in change with Zechariah, preaches and has visions for about three years. You see the key words there. The word of the Lord, 13 times. In that day, which is about the second coming, 20 times. And my goodness, the Lord of hosts, 45 times in that little book. The Lord's got something for us. The theme is the two advents of the Messiah. And if you go to Zechariah 9.9, 9, look over there. This is a key verse for the whole book, Zechariah 9.9. 9. The coming of the Lord, the advents of the Messiah. And if you see in Zechariah 9.9 9 and 9.10, you see both advents here. Zechariah 9.9. 9. You with me? Say amen. amen. All right, that was pretty good for Thursday night. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. Obviously, that is a reference to the first coming, right? All the gospel writers pick up on that. Then when he rides into Jerusalem, here comes the king of the Jews, Hosanna in the highest, and they all reference that part, first coming. But look at the next verse. And I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow shall be cut off and he shall speak peace unto the heathen and his dominion shall be from sea even to sea and from the river even to the ends of the earth. That didn't happen at the first coming. That's the second coming. So in the same like breath, you've got the first coming and the second coming happening together. Here's the key you got to remember. This is a key to unlocking your Bible. The first coming could have been the second coming if Israel had received Jesus Christ. And when you see that, that's why you'll get so many verses like this in Zechariah and other places in Daniel and other places in Isaiah where it looks like the two comings are like almost mixed together or all side by side because the prophets didn't see this thing called the church in the middle of that. They saw the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow, 1 Peter writes about. So they don't see this valley called the church age in between. They saw them like one after another. So the first coming could have been the second coming, you know what I mean when I say that, if Israel had received Jesus Christ as her Messiah. And Jesus Christ is pictured as the righteous branch. We'll talk about that a little later. So the breakdown's pretty good. The breakdown is chapters 1 to 8 are apocalyptic. A lot of tribulations, second coming, Armageddon. It's about God's chosen people and the temple. And you see God's care for his people, even in difficult times. You see all these visions here. Chapters 1 to 6, he has eight visions in one night. And I'll give you a little bit next to them. First one's about the writer. The word of the Lord comes to him as a vision. What does that tell us? God has not forgotten Jerusalem. That's the message of the first vision. Second vision is the horns and the carpenters. What's the meaning? God's going to destroy her enemies. The Gentiles, he talks about getting torn down. Third vision is the man with the measuring line or the plumb line. What's the message? Jerusalem will be restored and rebuilt. Then you get this vision of Joshua the high priest and his change of garments. What's the meaning? The nation will be cleansed. Then the candlestick and the trees. What's the meaning? God's power will finish the task. Then, we were joking about this before, in Zechariah 5, he sees the flying roll. And many people think about what that is. It's a UFO, because I don't know what it is, do you? It's an anodyne flying object. He looks up, he says, I see a flying, what do you see? I see a flying roll. And he goes, oh, it's a flying roll. And uh, what's it mean? Sin's going to be judged in the land. It has to do with sin being judged. Then a little later in Zechariah 5, he sees this woman. 
in this basket with a talon of lead and she's got wings and it's, she's, in, she's in an ephah like a basket. It's like, huh? We'll get to that a little later. What's the meaning? Idolatry will be punished. Then Zechariah 6, we get the war chariots come out. What's the meaning? God controls the nations and Israel is safe. God has not forgotten Jerusalem. God will destroy her enemies. Jerusalem will be restored. The nation will be cleansed. God will finish the task. Sin will be judged. Idolatry will be punished. And God's in control. And Israel is safe. Pretty good message. Uh, and then you see the other things about 9 to 14, the burdens, etc. So let's dive into, I've got a lot of, since it's such a symbolic book and such a, a book with a lot of visions, we're going to walk through some of these Bible pictures I wanted to pull out and just talk about. Uh, and I think what it'll do is, I think what Zechariah is going to force us to do is see how good of a Bible student we are. Because Zechariah is a tough book because a lot of it is self-contained. Like, there's not a lot of cross-references, per se, to what's going on in Zechariah to other places. There are, but what we have to do is we have to put our Bible glasses on and we have to see the imagery, the phrases, and what do we know from other places in the Bible those correspond with so we can then make sense of what's happening in an otherwise maybe cryptic book. It's not cryptic, it's just you got to just use your Bible glasses. So let's look at Zechariah 1 and let's talk about the man among the myrtle trees. Sounds like a message, right? Or a, a country western song, right? Uh -huh. But we're going to read this and uh, I think it's in verse 7 it starts. Oh no, verse, verse 8. The man among, where are we in the Word of God? That's what I want to challenge you to think about. Where are we? Like, what's going on here? What is this a picture of? It says, I saw by night, and behold, a man riding upon a red horse, and he stood among the myrtle trees that were in the bottom, and the behind him there were red horses speckled in white, four horses. Uh, then said I, O oh my Lord, what are these? And the angel said on, that talked to me, said unto me, I will show thee, what these be. And he says, uh, let's go on, let's just pause for a second here. Okay, so where are we in the Word of God? 1.8, when is he having this vision? I saw by night. That's a key. Because doctrinally, the night is the Great Tribulation. Practically for us, the church age is likened to the night. But Jesus Christ talks about four watches of the night. The night is also, looks forward to the Tribulation. For Israel. So, okay, now I know when we are. Let's keep going. Verse 10. And the man that stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, These are they whom the Lord hath sent to walk, watch it now, to and fro through the earth. And they answered the angel of the Lord that stood among the myrtle trees and said, We have walked to and fro through the earth. These horses, these beings, these whatevers, right? They're moving to and fro through the earth. Now, I know that phrase. I've seen that phrase. In the book of Job chapter 1, in the book of Job chapter 2, God asks Satan, hey boy, what are you doing? He says, oh, I've been walking up and down and to and fro in the earth. So now I know I'm in the night, tribulation, I've got some things that are moving to and fro, tribulation, because Satan moves to and fro in the earth in the book of Job, and Job is a picture of the nation of Israel in the great tribulation when Satan is literally moving to and fro in the earth. Revelation 12, woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you having but a little time. Right? Uh, right? I may mess that up a little bit, but you know the, word. You know the thing, right? I heard somebody use that, right? So in chapter 1, we have the scene set of Israel in the Great Tribulation. And that sets the scene of the book of Zechariah. The first vision really puts Israel in a time of trouble. Now go to Zechariah 3. Actually, while you're going to Zechariah 3, just, just stop at Zechariah 2.6. This was not in my notes, but it makes good sticking. Ho, ho, come forth and flee from the land of the north. I mean, who do you know that comes from the land of the north and says, ho, ho, ho? I don't know about that, you know. 
I know that's Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus Christ is the one that says ho, 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 by the way, in the Bible, but I wonder who would want to steal that thunder. But anyway, keep going with me. Um, I know they, they give gifts to each other in the book of tribute, the book of Revelation, and they make merry. That's interesting. Somebody's cutting a tree down in Jeremiah 10 and decking it so with silver and gold. So you just, you just figure that all out. When you figure that out, let me know. But invite me over for the seven fishes. All right, but Emma, Zechariah 3. Zechariah 3. A picture of salvation of Israel. This is a great picture in Zechariah 3. And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord. That's Jesus Christ, by the way. And Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that has chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him. Oh, before I read that. Here we've got a great picture of the salvation of Israel. Who does Joshua represent? He's the high priest at this time. He represents the nation of Israel. What is he? He's filthy in sins. And Israel back then was filthy in sins. Oh, they got back in the land, but they hadn't really gotten right with God yet. Same thing in the future. Israel's going to go through that tribulation. They're going to be taking their left hooks and their right hooks and their wobs from God. And it's going to be at the end of that they're going to get right with God. Israel got back in the land in 1948, but they're not right with God. They're still filthy, just like Joshua was covered in these filthy garments. And you see in verse 1, right, verse 1, who's standing there to resist him but Satan, right? Satan is the accuser of the brethren, right? He's that prosecuting attorney. And he's saying, God, you, you can't, you can't, you can't rescue Israel. They crucified your son. You can't rescue Israel. They said his blood be upon us and upon our children. You can't rescue Israel. They've been Christ rejected for two millennia. You can't rescue Israel. That's what the devil does to you, isn't he? He's the accuser. Conviction is from the Holy Spirit. Son, you did wrong. Get it under the blood, confess it, make it right, let's restore relationship, let's go on, and I don't want to hear about it. That's what the Holy Spirit says. But the devil is just like, you did what? God saw that. God doesn't love. How could you be a Christian? How could you stand up there and teach the Bible? How could you give somebody a gospel track? God knows who you are. God isn't happy with you. That's the accuser. He's just trying to rub your face in the mud and just make you feel guilt. Conviction is spiritual. Guilt is satanic and fleshy because it's just it's based on our insecurities. It's based on maybe unclean spirits just trying to mess with your head. It's the devil. He's the accuser. And here he is literally pointing a finger at the nation of Israel, Joshua, and saying, this guy's dirty. How are you going to take, how are you going to welcome this guy? How are you going to restore these people? They're dirty. They're filthy. And in verses 2 and 4, you see in verse 4, what is that angel say and he answered and spake unto those that stood before him saying take away the filthy garments from him and unto him he said behold i have caused this is a great verse i have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee and i will clothe thee with change of raiment who's the other one standing there the angel of the lord who is that that's jesus christ who's jesus christ he's the advocate he's the defense attorney and what's he say on behalf of the nation of Israel? I'll take away your filth. I'll let it pass away. I'll clothe thee with a new garment. That's Jesus Christ taking away the sin of Israel. Now, hallelujah, you and I, I got written in my Bible, praise the Lord, exclamation point, I have this spiritually. Because <laughs> spiritually, the devil says, you're not good enough to go to heaven. You're not good enough to enter God's presence. You're not good enough to call yourself a Christian. Jesus Christ says, you're right. I've caused his filth to pass away. I've given him a robe of righteousness. Isaiah, I think it's 61, right? right? Oh, and that's what he gave you. He gives Israel that to them, literally, but spiritually, you've got that cleansing. You've got that change of raiment. What does the Lord promise to Israel in the book of Romans, chapter 11, verse 27? He says, This is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. Right? Jesus Christ is going to, when they receive Jesus Christ, he's going to take away their sins and give them that robe of righteousness and that accuser of the brethren isn't going to have anything to bark about anymore because he's going to say, what sins are you talking about? I don't remember them anymore. Right? They're gone. God says they're gone. Uh, Hezekiah said, you cast all our sins behind your back. That's what he does for Israel. 
in the future, that's what he did for you in the past. That's a great picture of Joshua's change of garments, the salvation of Israel. You didn't read about that prodigal son, right? Put a ring on his finger and shoes on his feet and bring forth the best robe. I know we like to preach about us. That's really about them. Because they're going to get there. They're the prodigal son. They're the son, Israel, that went astray. And when they come back home, the father's got a robe for them. A change of raiment for them. You see it pictured right there in Zechariah. All right? And in case you were wondering about the date, Josh, it's the same date as Haggai, right? Because they're, they're contemporaries, right? Around 520 B.C. Um, how about this one? Zechariah 3, verse 8. How about Jesus Christ, the branch? Jesus Christ is pictured as the branch in, in, in the book of Zechariah. And in the Bible, and this is a capital B, Jesus Christ is called the capital B branch six times. And um, there's a fourfold mention of the branch that lines up with the four Gospels that line up with the four perspectives of Jesus Christ as king, servant, man, and son of God. So I like to walk you through those verses. Good to write these down because it show you another beautiful testimony that this Bible was not written by some dumb shepherds in the Middle East. Amen. Go to Jeremiah 23. Does it ever hit you sometimes that you hold the words of the Creator in your hands? <laughs> sometimes I'm up here saying these things to you or listening to somebody say it to me and I'm like, what are we talking about? I got the words of God. These are the words of God here. And in Jeremiah 23, verse 5, here's a branch. All right? <clears throat> Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. There's number one. There's the branch, the king. Right? He's the king. That lines up with the book of Matthew that presents Jesus Christ as a king, the king of the Jews. Remember the four Gospels? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John each give us a different perspective of who Jesus Christ is. Matthew sees him as a king. Mark sees him as a servant. Luke sees him as a man. And John sees him as the Son of God. Those are pictured by the four beasts, right? The lion, the ox, the man, and um, the eagle, right? So those, the king, lion, servant, ox, man, face of a man, and eagle, divine, Son of God. Those are the four faces of the beast, you see. And the branch is lined up with that. This first branch here is lined up with a king, the book of Matthew, the lion. Go to Zechariah, go back to Zechariah 3.8. Am I making sense? Does that make sense? I know it's like deep, that's deep water. I know it's a lot of information, but it'll stick eventually. It'll stick. I didn't get it the first, the 50th time. I heard it too but it'll stick. Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. Wow. There's the book of Mark. The ox, the servant. The branch is a king, and the branch is a servant. Okay? It's like God wrote the Bible. Wow. How about Zechariah 6, 12? 6.12. <clears throat> and speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man. <laughs> right? That's in John chapter 19. Behold the man. That's what Pilate said. Behold the man whose name is the branch. So that lines up with the book of Luke. Luke was a medical doctor, and he was focused on the humanity of Christ. So you see Jesus Christ pictured as a man in the book of Luke, and there he is, the branch is a man. Mark gives no genealogy for Jesus Christ. You know why? Servants don't need a genealogy. We don't care about the genealogy. Mark jumps right into what Jesus Christ starts doing. Because you know what? A servant does things. In the book of Matthew, you sure get some genealogies, right? Because 
he's a king, and he has to, the first thing Matthew does is lay out the genealogy of the king, right? Because Jesus Christ is the king of the Jews in the book of Matthew. The lion, the ox, the man. And if you go to Isaiah chapter 11, uh, verse 1 and 2, Isaiah 11. In my head, I hear Ruckman going, ah, the unsearchable riches of the Elizabethan English. How unsearchable are their ways. <laughs> right? Isaiah 11, verse 1. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. There is the branch, the Son of God. The divine. And there's also in Isaiah 4, talks about the branch like that. But there we have... The king, the servant, the man, the son of God. The branch, capital B. The branch. One's a little different. Zechariah 4. Let's go to Zechariah 4. Again, I'm just flying through some pictures here. And then got, a, got more pictures than messages from the book of Zechariah. So we did uh, the man among the myrtle trees. That tells us where we are. Joshua's change of garments, Israel's salvation. The branch, there's Jesus Christ. How about those two golden candlesticks? I've heard many people ask me, who are, who are, what is that? Right? All right, let's look at Zechariah 4. Let's go to verse 1. And the angel that talked with me came again and waked me as a man that is wakened out of his sleep and said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick all of gold with a bowl upon the top of it and his seven lamps thereon and seven pipes to the seven lamps uh, which are upon the top of thereof and the two and two olive trees by it one upon the right side of the bowl and the other upon the left side thereof so I answered and spake to the angel that talked with me saying what are these my lord as two golden candlesticks and you might be asking the same question that Zechariah is asking who are they What's going on here? Well, let's identify some things, Bible students. Let's just see if we could figure some stuff out. Notice in verse 3, it says olive trees. Notice in verse 12, it says olive branches. So we know, number one, they're connected to Israel. Because Israel is connected to that olive tree. So we know whoever these things are, whatever these people are, whatever they represent, there's somebody that's connected to Israel. That's a hint. Then verse 12, And I answered again and said unto him, What be these two olive branches, which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? Before you let your head spin around, We've got two golden pipes emptying out golden oil. What are pipes always preaching, uh, picturing in the Bible? Preaching. Your wind pipes, right? Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Spare not. So we've got these pipes that are sending forth this sound and emptying out this oil. Oil pictures of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's words. So somebody here is preaching. There's a picture here of preaching. We've got somebody connected to Israel that's declaring something preaching something, sending forth God's Spirit through words. You know, every time you preach God's Word, you're emptying out oil. You're sending forth God's Spirit, right? You're actually preaching, you're declaring God's Spirit because those words are Spirit and they are life, Jesus said. I'm not trying to get mystical on you or Pentecostal on you or kind of like, you know, prosperity gospel on you, but when you preach and declare the words of God, you are, that's God's Spirit coming out of your mouth. Those are his words coming out of your mouth. So that's something living. That's that golden oil. Oil is a picture of the Holy Spirit in the Bible. Now, verse 14. Then said he, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. So we've got two olive trees and two olive branches. Somebody's connected to Israel. We've got golden pipes. Somebody's preaching God's word. And then he says, there are two anointed ones, people set aside for a special service or ministry that are standing by the Lord of the earth. Well, who stood by the Lord? Moses and Elijah. Right? On the Mount of Transfiguration, Moses and Elijah stood by the Lord of the earth. 
And if you flip over to Revelation 11, you'll see these people show up. Remember from our first, from our first chapter, the man among the myrtle trees told us we're in the Great Tribulation. That's where we are. And here we are, Revelation 11, we're in the Great Tribulation. And who do we have showing up in the Great Tribulation? Two somebodies. <laughs> Revelation 11, look at verse number 3. He says, and I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days. That is 42 months. Same time of the Great Tribulation. Same number of chapters in the book of Job, 42, that lines up with the Great Tribulation. Like God wrote the Bible, right? Um, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees, Zechariah 4, and the two candlesticks, Zechariah 4, standing before the God of the earth. So in the Great Tribulation, Moses and Elijah preach to the nation of Israel. And you know what? They're the two witnesses, because Moses represents the law, and uh, Elijah represents the prophets, and on these two, that, that, that's the witnesses right there, man, the law and the prophets, and they're declaring. And if it didn't get any clearer, look at the next verse. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut rain. Who's that? That's Elijah. You ever see when people threatened Elijah? What did he do? He called down fire and he destroyed his enemies. And what did Elijah do for, three, for, I think, three and a half years, right? He, he shut the heavens up that there was no rain, right? So there's Elijah. Keep reading. As if the Bible needed to be any more explicit. And have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues. Who's that? That's Moses. Moses smote the river and it turned to blood, and Moses brought on the plagues. I've heard people say that's. I've heard many people say who they two, who they think these two people are. It's kind of funny if you really know your Bible. It's clearly Moses and Elijah, the law and the prophets, bearing witness to Israel. Those are the two witnesses. We got that part. Amen. All right, let's keep going. We're almost there. Let's go to the woman with the wings. Not the one with the wind beneath their wings, but the women with the wings. Go to Zechariah 5, okay? I mean, verses 1 to 3 are great. The flying roll. There's your UFOs in the Bible. Because, like I said before, I don't know what that is. So it's an identified flying object. I gotta love Zechariah's honesty. Then I turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a flying roll. And he said to me, what seest thou? And I answered, I see a flying roll. <laughs> what else are you going to say? I mean, that's what it was to him. Uh, but let's go to verse 5. Then the angel that talked with me went forth and said unto me, Lift up now thine eyes and see what is this that goeth forth. And I said, here's another honest man, what is it? And he said, this is an ephah, like a basket, that goeth forth. He said, moreover, this is their resemblance through all the earth. And behold, there was lifted up a talent of lead, and this is a woman that sitteth in the midst of the ephah. And he said, this is wickedness. And he cast it into the midst of the ephah, and he cast the weight of lead upon the mouth thereof, then lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, there came out two women, and the wind was in their wings, for they had the wings like the wings of a stork, and they lifted up the ephah between the earth and the heaven. Then said I to the angel that talked with me, Whither do these bear the ephah? Where are they taking this thing? And he said unto me, To build it in house in the land of Shinar, that's Babylon, and it shall be established and set there upon her own base. So what have we got here? We've got a picture of idolatry in the Great Tribulation. Let's see how we arrive at that interpretation, all right? Verse number seven, we got a woman. Now, that woman, that spirit is not a good spirit. I love you ladies, but the spirit of Jezebel is alive and well in the Great Tribulation. It's an evil spirit. 
Proverbs 2, Proverbs 5, Proverbs 7 re- talks about an evil female spirit that's trying to seduce God's servants who go right on their ways to their own destruction. That is the spirit of Jezebel that will be seducing the prophets of God and the people of God in the tribulation who want to go right in their ways but seduce them into the false worship of the beast. Anywhere you see false worship in your Bible, false religions in your Bible, there's a woman, a spirit of a woman, that queen of heaven, lining up right there. Right? Interesting that a very big religion that lives in our world worships a queen of heaven. Very interesting. Right? Um, Notice in verse 9, these women have wings. Now I know you've seen many a chick track where the angels have wings, and many a chalk talk, where somebody draws angels with wings to kind of help you locate who they are. Angels don't have wings. Anywhere, anytime, any place. You say, but there's this little grotto. Yeah, I know. There's no wings on an angel in the Bible. I know they sculpt them with wings, they paint them with wings, we kind of like sell these little fat babies with wings, and we say those are little angels. Angels, according to God's word, don't have wings. You know when somebody saw an angel? They saw a 33-year-old male. That's what they saw. They saw a young man when they saw an angel. Uh, So that's not, you know who's got wings? Devils have wings in the Bible. Mark chapter 4, Jesus Christ tells a parable, and he talks about the fowls of the air, some birds coming down and devouring the seed of God's word. Doesn't the devil walk about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour? Don't we pray, rebuke the devourer? So you got some birds devouring the Word of God. They're devils. They're not demons. They're devils in the Word of God. Mark 4.15, Jesus Christ then tells you who those fowls of the air are in the Word of God in the parable. He says, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. Right? He says, those fowls of the air are connected to Satan. One devil, many devils. Isn't he called the prince of the power of the air? Doesn't he say over there in Isaiah, don't seek to wizards that peep like little birds? (laughs) Right? Now go to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Haven't you ever heard the saying, I know Eli likes the saying, a little bird told me so. That's going to literally be fulfilled possibly in the Great Tribulation. That little bird is a devil. And they're listening. And they're eavesdropping. Reporting back. Look at Ecclesiastes 10.20. Curse not the king, no, not in thy thought, and curse not the rich in thy bedchamber, for a bird of the air shall carry the voice, and that which hath wings shall tell the matter. Now, you say, what are you getting at, Pat? I think that will literally be fulfilled in the Great Tribulation under the Antichrist. Because not everybody's going to like the Antichrist and he's going to have all these devils flying around and if you sit in your bedchamber and you start talking trash about the Antichrist and his kingdom, guess what? Something with wings will go tell the matter. And uh, that may literally be fulfilled in the Great Tribulation. You know where it's being previewed? In all those spy grids they like. Like in China. You know what they got in China? All this facial recognition software. You know what they're trying to do? Monitor everywhere you go, everything you say, everything you are, every word you mutter. The airwaves report back to somebody. You know what that is? That's a preview of the Antichrist kingdom where somehow those air... Doesn't doesn't something in you get vexed by that? I don't think that's just because you're American. I think this, the, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. The idea of being watched, everything you do, everything you say, you know, facial recognition glasses, fake, facial recognition cameras, the fact that there's nowhere to hide, that this government's just watching you all the time, that just makes you groan in the Spirit. That's not liberty. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And I know we like that as an American, but I think there's something spiritual to that too. 
because Satan's going to be watching you lock, step, and barrel. We see in other parts of the world where these chai comms reign supreme. You know what? And I'll say that word. I don't care if I get a strike, but that stuff is satanic. It's wicked. It's hell-bent. And they think that's the model for the new world. Listen to the leaders. They think places like China are the model citizens, the model places where you've got social credit scores, where if you help your neighbor across the street, you show up drunk, it knocks your social credit score down, and they kind of decide what colleges you can and cannot get into, and the way you act is all recorded on this giant grid, and there's cameras on this giant grid just watching everywhere you go, everything you say, everything you do, and they say that's the model for the new world order. You better believe it is. That's what they think. And right there it seems to say that somewhere that Antichrist is going to have the airwaves, something with wings, telling him what everybody's doing. He can't be in all places at all times. He's not God. He's got a legion that's out there working for him. Did I scare anybody? Did that make any, make any sense? Okay. And if you remember back in Zechariah, where is this happening? In the land of Shinar. Babylon. Go to Revelation 18. Revelation 18, 2. Hurry with me now. Got to hurry. Got a little too stuck on chai comms. Um, Revelation 18, 2. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become, watch it, the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. I don't think I need to say any more. And in the Great Tribulation, Babylon is a habitation of devils and unclean spirits pictured and typified by his birds. Zechariah 13, hurrying right along here. The women with wings, got that. How about there is a fountain? Zechariah 13, verse 1. Here the Lord Jesus Christ is pictured as a fountain at the second coming. In that day. What is in that day always about? Second coming. In that day there shall be a fountain opened to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. The Lord Jesus Christ pictured as that fountain. Now, you've got to look at the chapter before to really get to appreciate that. Because in chapter 12, the expression in that day occurs six times. Chapter 12 is all about that second coming. All about that second coming. In fact, if you look at verse number 10, it's a beautiful verse. I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. That's Jehovah God speaking. He says, you pierced me. You know what that's a testimony for? A proof of? The deity of Christ. That Jesus Christ is God. They're not just going to look upon him whom they have pierced. God says they're going to look upon me whom they have pierced. You know who they pierced? God manifest in the flesh. And 3.1, 13.1, I should say, this was part of the inspiration for our song by William Cooper, There is a Fountain Filled with Blood. Right? He kind of draws from that verse. It's interesting he calls it a fountain because a fountain is a source or a spring of all that you need to be refreshed, right? But a fountain is not a geyser. It's not a hose. A fountain is something that you have to approach to get what you need. You've got to come to the fountain. You've got to come to Jesus Christ. You've got to approach Him to get that blessing. You have to come to the fountain. Last picture. The day of battle. Go to Zechariah 14. Here's a picture of the battle of Armageddon. 14, 1-3. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, that's rough stuff in the tribulation, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth 
and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. What is he talking about? That the battle of Armageddon, we've had a preview of it already? He's going to go forth and fight the same way he fought in the day of battle? What day of battle is he talking about? Well, go back to Joshua chapter 10, and here's the battle. It has to be in Joshua, because of course Jesus Christ is Joshua in type. Joshua chapter 10. Let's just pull out a few things about this battle. Joshua 10.5, you've got all these kings of the earth conspiring against Israel. That's what they're going to be doing in the future, right? That's what they're doing now. All the kings of the earth are conspiring against one little nation, Israel. Verse number 7. So Joshua ascended from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and all the mighty men of valor. So the kings of the earth are conspiring, and Joshua goes forth to fight for Israel like Jesus Christ goes forth with his mighty men. I hope you're in that number. Verse 11. Watch what happens. And it came to pass as they fled the enemies from before Israel and were in the going down to Beth Oron that the Lord cast down great stones from heaven upon them unto Ezekiel, and they died. They were more which died with hailstones. Notice that. Than they whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. Please notice that the Lord sends stones from heaven called hailstones that kill the enemies like the great hail of Revelation chapter 16, verse 21. At the end of the tribulation, Revelation 16, God sends hail from heaven to destroy his enemies. Verse 12. Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel, and he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand now still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of uh, Ajalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon, stayed, the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemy. The heavenly bodies are affected in Joshua 10. Well, guess what? In the Great Tribulation, you read about the sun and the moon being affected. And in case I didn't make my point clear enough, verse 14. And there was no day like that before it or after it, that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. That's the day of battle that they're referring to in Zechariah. When the kings conspired against them, when he rained hail from heaven, when Joshua went forth to fight, when the heavenly bodies were affected and Israel was delivered, that's exactly what happens in the tribulation. They surround Israel. Jesus Christ comes back to fight with his men. Hallelujah. Amen. He sends hail from heaven. He affects the heavenly bodies. And Israel is delivered when God himself fights for them. God himself fights for them. That's the picture. God fighting for Israel in the battle of Armageddon. Crushing the Antichrist, crushing his forces, and bringing in everlasting righteousness. Wow. All right. I can tell you're excited. So let me go back to Zechariah. I'll finish in Zechariah. We've got just three stops in Zechariah left. Let me give you two big ideas in the book of Zechariah. A lot of pictures, a lot of teaching tonight, but let me give you a few things to kind of <clears throat> maybe go home on for your heart. Number one. Let me just check this off so I don't get neurotic. There we go. All right. <clears throat> Jesus Christ is our future glory. Can I say that again? Jesus Christ is our future glory. He is our portion. He is our glory. He is our inheritance. Now, Zechariah is so much about the future. It's kind of like the book of Daniel. It's so much about the future, so much about future things, so much about the tribulation, the second coming, the, the, the crowning of the Messiah. It seems to follow then that if Zechariah is so much about the future, then Zechariah would be so much about the Lord Jesus Christ. And Zechariah is full of Jesus Christ. It's so much about Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ is our future glory. Anything good we have coming in the future, it hangs on Him. It's because of Him. And I should say, it's just Him. 
He is our future glory. Let me just rattle off some things. I won't look at all the verses for time's sake, but just some pictures of Jesus Christ in the book of Zechariah. 9.16, you've got a picture of your good shepherd in 9.16. I'm not going to read all these verses. In, in chapter 11, verses 12 to 16, he says, If ye think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed for me 30 pieces of silver, and the Lord said unto me, Cast it unto the potter. So we got there, we got the betrayed shepherd. Judas sold him for 30 pieces of silver, and when he tried to return it, it went to the potter's field. It's all prophesied you know, more than 500 years before Jesus Christ ever walked the earth in the streets of Nazareth and Jerusalem. Go to chapter 12, 10. We read it already. We got the pierced shepherd. They'll look upon me whom they pierced. Uh, 13, 7. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man that is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts. Smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered. You got the smitten shepherd. Didn't that happen in the garden? The shepherd was arrested, and everybody scattered. Verse, chapter 14, verse 4. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. We've got the coming shepherd. He puts his feet down on the Mount of Olives. He comes down at Sinai, but his feet actually touch down at the Mount of Olives. That's why he gave those last discourses on the Mount of Olives about the tribulation. Luke 21, Matthew 24, I think Mark 13, they're all in the Mount of Olives. Why? Because that's where he's coming back. That's where the day of the Lord happens. How about 14.9? And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day shall there be one Lord, and his name one. There is the crown shepherd. So much. And there's more. I could show you more. So much about Zechariah is picturing things about Jesus Christ. If Zechariah is about the future glory that's supposed to encourage the remnant, guess what? Jesus Christ is our future glory that encourages this remnant. What do we got? What do we got? We got one person. We got Jesus Christ. Your money's going to fail. Your health's going to fail. Your friends are going to fail. You got one thing to hold on to that'll never leave you, never forsake you, promises to share his glory with you. Lord, I will that they behold the glory which I had with thee before the foundation of the world. He says, Jesus Christ prayed that you'd be with him and share in the glory he had before he took on flesh. He is our future glory. The glory you get is the glory that he shares with you. If he's our future glory, then that's why it's so much about him in this book about the future. The future's coming, guys. Just hold on. Just make it to the bell. The bell's about to ring. The trumpet's about to sound. All we got to do is make it. We don't have to manufacture it. We just got to make it. We just got to stay faithful. It's required in stewards to be found faithful. Don't have to be superheroes. Don't have to think up a new way to evangelize. Just you got the instructions. Just keep that hold thou fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Just hold fast to it. And God says, I'll split that eastern sky. I'm coming to get you in the morning. He's our future glory. And secondly... And finally, Zechariah 1. The Lord is jealous for His people and Jerusalem. Zechariah 1.14 So the angel that communed with me and said unto me, Cry thou, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with a great jealousy. Look at chapter 8, verse 2. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I was jealous for Zion with great jealousy, and I was jealous for her with great fury. The Lord is jealous for his people, and he's jealous over Jerusalem. You know, Jerusalem is mentioned 41 times in Zechariah. There's only 14 chapters. 41 times. God is jealous for Jerusalem. He says over there, I forget, where did I write it down? I wrote it down. Is it 82? Where did I write it down? Oh, Deuteronomy 11, right? He says his eye is always upon that land, always looking at it, always looking over it. He's always thinking about it. The Lord has chosen Jerusalem. 117 says that. You flip over to 117. He says, um, 117 says, The Lord shall yet 
comfort Zion and shall yet choose Jerusalem. Uh, 2.12, 2.12, he says, um, the Lord shall inherit Judah his portion in the Holy Land and shall choose Jerusalem again. Verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 2, right? Is not this a brand, right? Hath not even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem? It's pretty amazing. So God's going to have mercy on this city and punish Jerusalem's enemies. He's jealous over Jerusalem. He's jealous for his people there. He's je they're, gonna, they're trying to split it. They're trying to parse it. They're trying to deal it out to the people. God's like, are you kidding me? My eyes are always upon that land. And I'm jealous over it. In Zechariah 8, let's look at this. Last verse. And, and, and here's the encouraging part. In the tribulation, God says that city is spiritually Sodom and Egypt. Filthy. You know what happened in Sodom. And you know what God thinks of Egypt. But God's going to change those hearts. God's going to change those people. And God's going to make that desert blossom like a rose and make what was ugly and filthy and sinful beautiful. You know how that's how God looks at us? He's jealous over you. You're his land right now. You're his little piece of dirt that he purchased with his blood. His eyes are always upon you. And you might be like Sodom and Egypt. You might be caught up in stuff. You might be walking in the world. You might be so full of stupidity like Sodom and Egypt. God says, you know what I can do for you? I can make you beautiful. Amen. I can restore you. I can strengthen you. I can give you everlasting righteousness. And when the Lord comes back, He's going to dwell in Jerusalem. Amen. Not just visit. He's going to dwell there. Zechariah 8.3 Thus saith the Lord... Man, this is just mind-blowing. I am returned unto Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem shall be called the city of truth. Wow. And the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, there shall yet old men and old women dwell in the streets of Jerusalem. And every man with his staff in his hand for very age. And the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in the streets thereof. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, if it be marvelous in the eyes of the remnant of this people in these days, should it also be marvelous in mine eyes, saith the Lord of hosts. Amen. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, behold, I will save my people from the east country and from the west country, and I will bring them, and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God in truth and in righteousness. Oh, Amen. what a day. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. What a day that will be. I know you're looking forward to getting out of here, but what about when we come back with him and he gathers all those people together and he puts them down there and a city steeped in idolatry, steeped in sin, steeped in lies, is a city of truth? And Jesus Christ sits down, rests there, reigns there, like the king that he is. I mean... Hollywood can't touch a, can't, can't hold a candle to that. And um, if the Lord is jealous over his people, you know what he's going to do? God will take care of his people. If he's jealous over you, God will take care of you. If God is jealous over that land, he's going to take care of that land. Even when it gets circled by the enemies of God, even when it gets circled by their enemies and they're ready to push a button to blow them and push them into the sea, whatever these guys want to do, God says, don't worry, don't worry. My eyes are always upon this land. I'm jealous over it. I'm going to step out just in time. And folks, if he dwells in you now, you're his land now in spirit and type and picture, guess what? He actually dwells in your body now. Guess what? He's jealous over you. You might look circled. You might look like in despair. You might look like, where am I going to turn for hope? Guess what? God says, lift up your eyes. I'm coming. I'll help. I'll be there. You know why? Because I'm jealous over you. We have a jealous God. Praise the Lord. So, like I said, explain the book of Zechariah to me when I get off this pulpit. But that was a little Zechariah. And God willing, I'd much rather go to heaven, but God willing, uh, we'll do Malachi next week and then put a rest to the book of the Old Testament for now. Let's pray and then we'll be dismissed. Thank you for your attention here tonight. Lord, thank you for all these beautiful pictures, Lord. Thank you for just who you are, dear God. Help us to trust you, Lord. Help us to have faith. Lord, increase our faith in just who you are. Not in always what you do, Lord, but 
If we know who you are, we know what you'll do will be right. Lord, you're kind and you're loving and you're always on time. So please, Lord, there's people in our midst. They need you to show up, Lord. They're they may be hanging on by a thread, Father. And I pray, Lord, someone watching from home, maybe, I pray you'd show up, Lord. Step out. Show up, Lord. Show them their strength and your power. And Lord, give us that patience. If we need to wait, give us patience and confidence in thee, the little remnant to wait on you and to know that you love us and you'll take care of us. In Jesus' name we pray.